Yes, hello you lovelies and welcome to This Week in Comics. This Week in Comics is absolutely huge. First off, I'm going to be diving into the Joker Folly Adieu in a full non-spoiler review. I promise not a single spoiler in that review. Tomorrow, if you want to check out spoilers, doing a full spoiler review right here on the same page, but saving that until the weekend the movie is fully out. Also, news-wise, going to be talking about the rumors that Sholo is going to be Blue Beetle, the rumors that we're getting a Teen Titans movie, and the confirmed Robin dynamic duo movie and why I'm so excited for that film to be the mix of mediums that it is. Also going to be talking about the Spider-Man noir updates and some Andrew Garfield Spider-Man updates. Lots of news this week. I cannot wait to dive into it. If you're new to this page, I read about 50 to 70 comics a week, not only to give context to all of the news, but to actually recommend comics themselves to new readers. So I break down nine comics I think you'd like each week from that prior week's books. This week was an especially good week in comics, so I'm actually going to do 11 or 12, and I break down the previews of what's to come that upcoming week. So this is Thursday, new comics just dropped yesterday, going to be previewing all of yesterday's books, reviewing all of last week's books, and breaking down all the news. That's what this show's all about. Stay tuned, this is This Week in Comics. Let's do the list. Spider-Man. Guilty. The Incredible Hulk. Afraid so. Oh man, this is so cool. The X-Men. Now that you mention it. All right, first of all, let's do a Joker non-spoiler review. You might have seen my first impression right out of the theater. Had to be pretty vague because it's a movie that all of my issues are going to be spoilers and a lot of the context of things can kind of be inferred, but I do think the movie is very intentionally divisive. Currently, the movie has a 54% Rotten Tomato score with 65 reviews, meaning only half of those 65 critics even thought it was passable, and it has a 51 Metacritic score. This is right down the middle, and I came out thinking the movie was good. I don't think it's great, I don't think it's as good as the first film, but I do think it's absolutely worth seeing, and I do think it absolutely has merit. And again, good, not great. When I walked out of the theater, it was like a three and a half, which to me is like a B. Now, I think settling on it, it is about a three. I think the film is a C plus, um, bordering on a B minus, and my overall experience with the film is, it is visually stunning. The performances, I thought, were mostly amazing. I thought Lady Gaga did a great job with the character choices she had made and Todd Phillips had made. I thought Joaquin Phoenix brought even more nuance to the character that he'd made so popular and won an Oscar for five years ago. I thought it absolutely made a deeper connection to Gotham as a character. I thought it absolutely had a lot of things to say. My problem is a lot of the things it had to say contradicted the visuals, contradicted the tone, contradicted the first film, but I like that I never knew what was coming next. I like that it kept me guessing. I like that the film itself is so beautifully shot that even when the narrative bothered me, and oftentimes it did, it was such a spectacle to behold. It was such a an intense visual. And I honestly think the first film is clearly a love letter to Martin Scorsese and a love letter to films that don't get made often anymore. And the way that got made was by branding it the Joker, when it's effectively taxi driver, but instead of a taxi driver, it's a stand-up comedian, ostracized person, like, you know, it, you can't sell a movie and call it stand-up comedian to this scale. So it was called Joker, and it's very loosely an Elseworld of Joker. My logline, spoiler-free review, is that's this film continuing that story on, where it's a very loose Elseworld, now with a Harley Quinn loose adaptation, making a continued commentary on that world. And this is a musical because that's the kind of thing that also can't get made. They don't make these giant vaudevillian musicals. They don't make these big spectacle films that are so beautifully lit and so wondrously shot and so bombastic. And it is really hard to get things made. And I do think the Joker name is what sold this. And I do think it's a, it's a hell of a swing. I don't think a lot of it works with the narrative by the time they get to the end. And that's what I'm really excited to have a spoiler conversation about. I think tomorrow... When I can dive into spoilers, I can explain why it's not a three and a half anymore and why it's not a four and a half that I thought the first was and why it's also not a one that a lot of people are experiencing. I think this film antagonizes a lot of the people that see the Joker in a way, the character of Arthur Fleck in a way that I don't think was meant to be portrayed when Joker was in the comic and I don't think was necessarily the intent of how you're supposed to walk away from the first film. So I think this plays on a lot of the narratives and the experiences and emotions 
of people's expectations from the first film in a very interesting way. So I'm really excited to talk about all that tomorrow. Um, I did think at points the music pulled you out of the experience. I do think it dragged. Um, I do like the narrative choice of why the music is there, and I think it's interesting. And I do, uh, I do think it's something that is so correct for the character. But I do think some of the songs were too long, and I do think some of the choices didn't fit their narrative. The impetus behind the songs absolutely worked for me, but the actual song choices and the length of them and everything really caused a very disparate tonality. Like, the movie is this sometimes, and this sometimes, and it doesn't stay chaotic enough to necessarily work. Now, the film opens in one very specific type of way, and then it is a very different movie, and then it zigs and zags in a musical, but it's by all means a musical. And I think that is very consciously antagonistic in a lot of ways, and I think that's a conversation that is tied to the ending. And I get why people didn't like it. I actually completely understand the 54% Rotten Tomato score and the 51 critic, because the half the people that liked the swings, I'm with, but I don't disagree with people not liking it. I also don't find bleak films like this all that enjoyable, so I won't be watching it again, so it isn't that high up for me out of just the visuals, like three, like I said, C plus, B minus, but it is so well crafted most of the time. It is so well directed, acted. Again, the lighting is stunning. The production design is wonderful. I don't agree with the characterizations of Joker and Harley Quinn in this film, but I didn't in the first film either. I didn't leave the Joker 2019 going, I've just seen a Joker film. I left going, what an interesting take on the archetype of the Joker in making a Martin Scorsese love letter. I left that going, this character is broken and messed up and now I'm affected for it and I've had an interesting journey watching a character. The second film, I had another interesting journey watching a man, a broken man, experience the trauma of the story and that's the same as the first film. I lived through something else. It didn't go like, oh, great, a, a spinoff of Batman. It's not, but it has more Easter eggs than the first film, oddly, because it's even less of that world, but it didn't hurt the Joker character for me in a lot of the ways that I'm reading a lot of people think it did for them. And that, I think, is what your experience of the first film is. I never thought the first film was the Joker, so I wasn't affected by some of the choices in the second film as much as people that are like, yeah, Joaquin Phoenix is the Joker. To me, it was always another thing entirely. So I'm really excited to see what people think of it overall. I think 54% slash 51 is fair to the way the scores actually are. I think that I give it a C plus, B minus, but I also think half people not liking it is totally fair to how odd and, and broken and, and deranged this film is. So uh, tomorrow, stay tuned for a spoiler full review with all the things I couldn't really talk about here. I am very excited to talk about it. I don't think it's for everyone, but I think it's worth seeing it big and bold if you want to see it. It is a spectacle in a very different way than like the Avengers is a spectacle. It's a very different spectacle in the way that the Batman is a spectacle. It's a spectacle in sadness and brokenness and performances that are so under your skin and rotting and festering like Gotham is and seeing it big and zooming in on it is a hell of a thing again, just like it was in 2019. So that's why I like it more than I guess a lot of people have. And that's why I do think it's worth seeing, but I never considered any of this any sort of canon, even the loosest of. It's not, it's Arthur Fleck. The movie is called Joker, but Arthur Fleck is not Batman's nemesis. Batman was a child in the first film. Bruce Wayne is a literal child. It was never that Joker. It was never the Joker. It was a Joker on stage and broken. So uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to talk about it tomorrow. Please stay tuned. If you're new to this page, hit that subscription bell because I'll be back with more Joker coverage. I go to it a little uh, differently in yesterday's Out of the Theater Reaction. So if you're also curious about some more thoughts, check that out. It is, uh, it is two videos ago. Um, I'm really trying to grow this page. So please hit that subscription bell, as I said. And also, let's have a conversation in the comments below about Joker or any other news from today. Speaking of the news of the day, and speaking of DC, we have our next DC Studios confirmed film with Dynamic Duo. Now, this is a film that is going to be a mix of CGI, of animation, and most intriguingly, of puppetry. Now, I'm not sure if uh, licensing-wise I can keep this video up. It might make me cut it, but I'm going to show you a few seconds of the masterminds that are making these puppets that are absolutely like nothing I've ever seen, and this is why I'm excited for the film, in addition to being about Robin. Check this out. All right, moving. Get the two shot. No zoom. Awesome. That was awesome. 
So that's crazy to me. Like that is such an inventive format. So to me, this immediately goes, okay, DC's found their spider verse in that it's going to be telling a unique story in a very unique way with characters that are absolutely iconic, but aren't like you might not be able to sell this as Batman, but you can sell it as Robin. And I think that's fantastic. I think we should have had a Miles Morales live action five years ago, but getting Miles Morales, Miles Morales in that stunning animation, those two Spider-Verse films are two of my favorite comic films of all time, and it makes me love Miles even more. I'm ready to love Robin even more. And we're getting two Robins that dub themselves the dynamic duo. I'm so excited for this. We are getting Nightwing after all this time. We are officially getting the insanity of Jason Todd opposite Nightwing, which is going to be brooding and intense and violent. And James Gunn confirmed it, so this is absolutely real, saying, Over the moon, excited to announce the, new, the newest DC Studios slash Warner Brothers Pictures animation greenlit for theaters. Also very important to me. Dynamic duo, the story of Robin, or should I say Robins, as in Dick Grayson and Jason Todd. The first feature film from the visionary Swaybox, which is that footage, a mix of animation, puppetry, and CGI. A script from the wonderfully talented Matt Aldrich, produced with our partners at Matt Reeves 6 in Idaho. This is something special. So, Robin Origin confirmed. Dick Grayson and Jason Todd as orphan thieves who call themselves a dynamic duo, produced by Matt Reeves and James Gunn, but not part of the canon of Matt Reeves' universe. People are like, oh, he hates Robin. Well, he's making a full-on two-Robin movie. He doubly doesn't hate Robin. I'm very excited for this Robin. Also, it's going to be a mix of all those mediums, so I cannot wait to see visually what this looks like. And this is the guy that wrote Coco. The writer of Coco telling a young Robin story, an origin story, like all the heart of Coco and a Robin story with those blended types of animation from Matt Reeves and James Gunn. I am so excited. Dynamic Duo, uh, this was just announced this week. Very excited to see where it goes from there. Now, those are confirmed uh, details, right? Like, and the internet is full of mistruths. I usually don't report on rumors, but this is from Variety, so it feels pretty credible. But until James Gunn says it himself, I'm going to take this as a rumor, so just be aware. There is a largely accredited rumor that we're getting a Teen Titans movie. Now, this has been bouncing around a long time. I remember reporting on it months ago when it was a lot looser. Now, with Variety saying it, we also have a writer. In a new article diving into Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, which I, is my number two most anticipated DC property, I am so excited for that. Uh, Gunn describes that movie, by the way, as a science fiction words science fiction epic debuting in 2026, and then states that after describing Woman of Tomorrow, that the writer of that will be writing Teen Titans. So that sounds like a pretty solid confirmation, and that writer is Anna Noguaria, and that writer is being trusted with one of my favorite comic stories of all time, and one of my favorite, it's my favorite Supergirl story, but one of my favorite comics, Hard Stop Period. So if she adapted that so beautifully that the movie is going to be the love letter to that story, I hope it is, I'm very excited to see her handle Teen Titans, and clearly they're proud, excited, confident in the script that she's getting the next property after that. So it looks like we're getting a Superman, Supergirl, Teen Titans, one, two, three punch from DC. Don't know what that means for um, Batman's uh, DCU standing. Like Brave and the Bold, I think is still happening, but I think we're going to see the Batman 2 and the little distance before the Brave and the Bold. So it might be fourth after Teen Titans, but I know Teen Titans fans have wanted a live action movie for a very long time. I'm very excited for a Teen Titans movie. I love Love the George Perez stuff. So this has me excited. Are you excited for a Teen Titans movie? Let me know in the comments below. Also, let me know what you think about that dynamic duo stuff. Like, are you excited for a Robin movie? It's been a huge week for DC coming off of everything they've gone through the last couple of years to have this very credible rumor of Teen Titans and the announcement of dynamic duo and last week's the heavily confirmed rumors of Jon Stewart and seemingly confirmed rumors of Kyle Chandler. Everything is coming together for DC and I'm so excited for them. That is everything that is mostly confirmed from that world of things going on at DC. Let's go from rumor to rumor though, because it is not confirmed yet. From a credible DC rumor to a potentially credible Marvel rumor, but keep both of the grain of salt. These are still rumors. Let's talk Nova. Now, Nova has been something we've been teased for a very long time. It's been rumored to be a movie. It's been rumored to be a show. Kevin Feige has said we're getting Nova, but we didn't know how, and we didn't know who. Is it going to be a Richard Ryder Nova that's going to feel like, you know, Green Lantern-ish? Or is it going to be a Sam Alexander Younger Nova that feels more Young Avenger, uh, Challengers? Like, where is this character going to fit? And now it looks like we're getting both. It seems, if rumors are true, that Sholo Miridwanya, I'm not sure if I'm saying that last name right, 
is going to be our Sam Alexander. Now, I'm so excited about this because Sholo is a delight. The guy is so talented. This kid is such a force of nature on Cobra Kai. He was incredible in Blue Beetle and everything around that movie was out of his control. A movie that's coming out as one era of your studio is shifting gears into another one. It's not tied into continuity, so it's supposedly going to be moving into the new era, but it just feels so messy. And I, and I hope he still gets to be Blue Beetle, but in case he doesn't, if he got to be Sam Alexander, if he got to be the MCU's Nova, that would be so special. And this guy, I know from cons, I know from events, I've talked to him a lot about movies, about art. His passion for comics is crazy. Whenever I see him at a con, not only is he super cool to every single fan and stays hours, but he also really loves talking about the actual comics and the art itself. And I really respect the guy. Like he's so passionate. So if this rumor is true, I am so excited. But the rumor is we're not just getting one Nova, we're getting two. And Tanner Gilman, someone I don't know at all, is rumored to be Richard Ryder. Now, I don't know this actor. I don't recognize this actor, so I can't speak to him. I only know Sholo acquaintance through events, but I know his work, and his work is spectacular. Like, Blue Beetle, so strong, his performance especially. I honestly think what he does with Cobra Kai is a very tight rope to walk, and I think he would nail this Nova role, and I'm very excited that we're getting at least closer to Nova existing in the MCU. What do you guys think about Sholo Miradwanya as Blue Beetle, Sam Alexander, not Blue Beetle, about as Nova, and let me know what you think of this other guy as Richard Ryder Nova, because I don't know his work at all. Let me know if I should be excited. Let's have a conversation about Nova. I'm so excited in the comments below. Now, while we're over at Marvel, I do want to talk some Sony Marvel, because we got popcorn buckets, okay, guys? Like, I know we're probably sick of talking about them. I love the Xenomorph one. I love the Deadpool ones, obviously. I love when they make some art out of these, and Venom is certainly no exception. This video popped up on the internet, and I was like, that is preposterous, and I'm so excited. I love how, like, viscous it looks. I love that the symbiote looks wet. And then Regal Cinema specifically has these exclusive Venom popcorn buckets, so I just wanted to give them some love. I'm very excited for this movie. I love how absurd these are and how it fits the absurdity of the style of comedy and tone of the films. This, if anything, is going to get a popcorn bucket right here. Uh, I've got my Wolverine one. I am a happy, just nerddom. Getting to this scale makes me happy. And speaking of the Sony Universal Spider-Man characters, Andrew Garfield said, quote, this week, when asked if he would come back as Spider-Man, saying, I love that character and it brings joy. If part of what I bring is joy, then I'm joyful in return. One, poetry. Two, I want this so bad. Three, there have been so many rumors about a bigger, broader, multiversal Spider-Man. The only way I don't want street level is Garfield. Like if, if we're not getting a street level Spider-Man, which we deserve and has been long overdue, if we have to go multiversal, my lemonade from lemons is that means Andrew Garfield. And this dude is my Spider-Man. He is so exactly how I see the character. I want the guy back. So this gives me hope. It brings me joy. And I love his joyful response. So he took a, a, a year or two break from acting. He's back. He's rejuvenated. He's loosened up. Bring on the Spider-Man. I'm very excited. And speaking of loosening up and being silly, um, not going to dive too deep into it, but Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman did the Disney wand magic from the Disney Channel of our youth. What a great way to market Deadpool and Wolverine. There's a, there's a Green Lantern joke in there that the, half the internet thinks is hilarious, half is very mad at. I think it's funny. Uh, but it's it's to me, this is just joy. I, I love the joy of Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman on the Disney Channel because... That's insane. And Ryan Reynolds uh, was in a Disney Channel original film back in the day. So these guys both being Disney princes. That's right. That makes me so happy. Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool and Hugh Jackman as Wolverine are canonically Disney princes. And they're on Disney Plus slash the Disney Channel. Wand up. Incredible. All right. That is the news from this week. What are you most excited about? Are you excited for the potential Nova situation? Are you excited for Joker and my non-spoiler review? What did you think of my thoughts on the film? Are you excited for the potential Teen Titans movie? Are you excited for the confirmed Robin movie? It's a very big week. Let's have a conversation in the comments below. And let's talk about last week's comics themselves, the actual books. As I said, I read, I think last week was about 65 comics from the week of September 25th. Mere days ago, I've been reading like crazy so I could catch up in time for you. Let's talk about my favorite comics from that week. All right, let's talk about the comic books themselves, you lovelies. These are my favorite books from last week, the week of September 28th. And it is one of the best weeks in comics of the year. I had 12 A's and another five B pluses. Usually as a B plus and A's that make my top nine, it is stacked. So I'm actually gonna do a few bonus this week. 
Let's talk about the biggest sleeper hit, my surprise of the week. My first pull is going to be Amazing Spider-Man number 58. I've been very public about my not loving this current run. It's not how I see Spider-Man. I love John Meter Jr., the artist. I usually like Zeb Wells' stuff. About 50-50, this is definitely in the dark side. of. It's not for me. It's not how I see Spider-Man. This issue is a barn burner, a throwdown brawl with Tombstone. Everything is built to this fight, and it's actually living up to the tension. The art is stunning. John Amita Jr., the way he draws Spider-Man is so emotional, but also the violence, the intensity, the action, the... the it's just, it's hardcore. I dig it. Um, it's working for the end of the story. I'm glad the story is wrapping up in two issues. Really dug the action in this issue, and the writing was fine, but the action was so Spider-Man. Really like this one. 58 made the cut. Next up, we've got Anansi Boys, number four. I've talked about this every single month that's come out. It is written by Mark Bernardin, based off a story from Neil Gaiman, and it is beautiful. This book is about a man who loses his father and finds out he has a brother, and then it turns out, oh wait, they're gods. Uh, it's a crazy story. It involves so much joy and sorrow. It's so musical. It's so big and powerful. It feels like an old myth in comic form. I really dig Anansi Boys. This issue four was great. Next up, we've got Batman, The Long Halloween, The Last Halloween. Now, this requires some context. Tim Sale and Jeff Loeb wrote one of the most iconic Batman stories of all time called The Long Halloween. And it, to this day, holds up. It's one of the best. If you've seen The Dark Knight or The Batman, you see the influence from this one very iconic story. Tim Sale, unfortunately, passed away a couple years ago, very unexpectedly, very young. And this uh, story was was mapped, and they'd done some work on it. And unfortunately, passed away before they could finish it. And issue zero, which came out last week, was a reprinting of what was going to kick it off. So this issue is the first issue of this new continuation where a bunch of artists teamed up not in his style, very intentionally, but in the way he drew the character's costumes. Like, it looks like a continuation, but it's not making a Tim Sale drawing. It's like the extra long ears, the purple suit of Catwoman. Like, it's just an homage, but it's iconic artists taking on the rest of the story still with Jeff Loeb. And so far, it's amazing. I love living in this world again. I love the homage. Uh, if you like The Long Halloween or if you like Batman movies, check out The Last Halloween. Issue zero, if you read the two years ago, Tim Sale, Jeff Loeb, read back. It's a reprinting of that. But if you haven't, get issue zero from last week, issue one this week. This is so special and so good. And it's spooky season. It's great. I love this. Then we've got Helen of Windhorn, number five from Dark Horse. This is from Bilks Evely, who is the artist on uh, Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, one of my favorite DC stories of all time. And Tom King, who also wrote that comic, writing this as well. It's about a woman who is a raging alcoholic, loses her family, is very broken, and uh, discovers the wonders of going on adventures and uh, finds out her grandfather is every bit the mythic beast of books her dad wrote. It's a fascinating story about a woman basically becoming a boss and her relationship with her grandfather. And it's, I'm not doing it justice. Imagine myth and mysticism mixed with family trauma, shake it up, and then add cool dragons and classic like Conan the Barbarian imagery. It's awesome. Check out Helen of Windhorn. Highly recommend it. Then we've got Lobo Cancellation Special number one. Uh, this book is so Lobo. This book is bananas. This book, you can hear Lobo. And also, like, this is if ever proof that Jason Momoa was playing Lobo as Aquaman. This is Jason Momoa's book. Uh, it's why I love Lobo. It's the right blend of sarcastic and nihilistic and absurd, but the comedy sings in that. The violence is absurdist. It's so fun. This book is just fun. If you've never read Lobo, very approachable first issue. Very violent, ridiculous, absurdist. I love this stuff. This really worked for me. Then we've got Knights number 11. This title is so weird. A ragtag group of characters, teenagers uh, on various adventures. A lot of them are dead. Some of them are vampires. It's very spooky season, but this issue... All the issues but two have had such heart for me. Like those two, I'm sure, were fine for other people. But like the heart of this book, the compassion for these characters, the weird adventures they get into, mixed with the fact that when you turn the page, you never know what the next thing is going to be. It's so odd. It's so adventurous. It's so surprising. Knights is so good. Then we've got Predator versus Black Panther. This is the Predators, yes, because Fox is now owned by Disney. Those Predators going to Earth to take Wakandan uh, vibranium. Like, they're they're seeking vibranium as, like, this treasured metal they want for their weapons, and then they encounter, oh, wait, we gotta fight Black Panther, we gotta fight the uh, Dora Milaje, we've gotta, like, deal with the fact that warriors are already protecting vibranium. Love this. The story works, the art's great, the methodology and reasoning behind it all. This is such a fun crossover. Really dig this. And surprising no one, Saga, number 69, 
One, come on, they made a 69 joke on the cover. Two, it's bringing back plot points from the very beginning of Saga. Three, I love the way we're getting to dive deeper into characters that I thought we wouldn't actually get this much depth from. I knew we'd get stuff with Hazel. I was a little afraid we'd left uh, the, the characters behind from the ship and now it feels like they're all kind of pirates. I love the new character of the, the spider friend. This all probably doesn't make sense, but if you're reading this comic, it might. Saga is one of those books that every new character, every new frame, you're suddenly like, I love them. And then the, the horrible things happen. Uh, it's so good at being traumatic and it's so good at making you love. It's so good at the spontaneity of life. And this issue is very Squire heavy and what Squire's gone through. It's very, uh, you know, when you're young and have all these crazy hormones, but on a space adventure, read Saga. All right, just read Saga. It's so good. Book of the week. Even though this is Saga week, it was also an Ultimate Spider-Man week. This book is so good. Marco Cicchetto's art is is stunning. Jonathan Hickman writes the hell out of this character. Spider-Man talking to himself in this issue in a way that makes sense canonically, but also is so funny. The assembly of the Sinister Six here, the relationship with Harry and Peter Parker surprises you. The relationship with Uncle Ben and Jonah Jameson is one of my new favorite things in all the comics. You deal with some new Bugle stuff. You, Mary Jane here is why she should never be jackpot because she doesn't need powers and that's a silly thing they did to her. This is Mary Jane. I love this book. Read Ultimate Spider-Man. And then real quick, we're going to power through these. Uncanny X-Men number three. Great adventure, great team dynamics, great action with new X-Men that actually feel like interesting characters. They're not just powers with no personality. All four of these new young characters are interesting. Great rogue dynamics, great Wolverine dynamics. Really interesting having this uh, rogue gambit dynamic with her leading. And the covers remind me so much of classic X-Men covers. Just look at this cover. This new Uncanny is so special. Check it out. Go back to issue one. It's only issue three. You're not far behind. Read this. And finally, speeding the last two, Wolverine Revenge number two. Jonathan Hickman getting a, a blank check to do whatever he wants with Wolverine is paying off so well. Fascinating dystopian end of days stuff, but like modern world Nick Fury stuff. Fascinating, just weird, brutal Wolverine. And finally, Zatanna bringing down the house issue three. A fun retelling of some for origin stuff getting into her family dynamic, getting into her power set. I love Zatanna. I feel like she doesn't get enough credit. This is a really good black label book that really gets into her work. Really dug this. As you can see, these, plus a few more because I couldn't fit it in the grade, were my favorite comics of the week. All of these were A's. I kept saying, buy this, read this, because they're all that exceptional. Highly vouch for any of these. Let me know in the comments below what you read of these, if you had any favorites, if I missed anything. I loved this week in comics. There were so many comics this week that were fantastic. Let's talk about the comics coming up next week which dropped yesterday, Wednesday, October 2nd. We are somehow into October. These are the books I'm excited to check out October 2nd. As ever, this is in order of the books I'm pulling from each publisher. So there's the most books this week from Marvel. From Marvel for the week of October 2nd, yesterday is Wednesday. We've got Daredevil number 14, Deadpool number seven, Fantastic Four, Halloween Trick or Treat 2024. Loving that Fantastic Four. Excited to see what they do with Halloween. Get Fury number six, Ghost Rider, Robbie Reyes special number one, Immortal Thor number 16. That book's falling off a little for me. I'm hoping this one gets me back in. Uh, there's a Spider Boy Halloween Trigger Read 2024. I think these might be either discount or uh, freebies you can get at your local comic shop. And I think the Fantastic Four one is a crazy one with dinosaur versions of the Fantastic Four. And I think Spider Boy is issue one. Uh, Spider Gwen Ghost Spider number six. You've got Spidey Friends Hall Halloween Trigger Read 2024. If you have young kids that want to get into comics, the Spidey and Friends are a great place to start. Spider, uh, Star Wars Kylo Halloween Trick or Read 2024. That's issue one of the Kylo Ren series. We've also got Star Wars Inquisitors number four. Star Wars The Battle of Jakku number one. We've got Storm number one. A solo Storm title makes me happy. We've got Ultimate Black Panther number nine. We've got Ultraman times the Avenger. Oh, with, I guess that X. I was like, why are they multiplying them? Ultraman with the Avengers number two. Venom Halloween Trick or Read 2024. A lot of Halloween stuff. A lot, of, a lot of discounted comics. I love that. Makes me happy. Venom War number three. The big Venom War event has spinoffs, but the main title is only on issue three. It is huge. It's so much Venom. Uh, we've also got Venom War Spider-Man number three. I'm surprisingly cool with Spider-Man with the symbiote again with how they're telling it. We've got Wolverine Deep Cut number four and X-Men number five. And again, these X-Men covers are killing it. That is a classic X-Men cover right there. We've got from DC quite a few comics as well. We've got Absolute Power number four. Again, that's their big fall event. A lot of spinoffs, but this is their main part of that event happening. We've got 
Batman number 153, as well as Batman and Scooby-Doo Mysteries number 10, Birds of Prey 14. We've got the first all-in special spelling out what's going to be happening at DC soon with DC all-in special number one. DC Horror Presents Creature Commandos number one. I think that'll be important come December. First time we've seen Creature Commandos in this formation since the announcement. We've got DC's I Know What You Did Last Crisis number 10, I mean number one. Um, by the way, I got distracted because that Creature Commandos book, there was a Frankenstein book that came out about eight months ago, which was like a reprinting because James Gunn cited it as the tone. Uh, so I would read that Frankenstein book as well as this book. And then you'll be in a good spot as well as if you want more reading, uh, J.M. DeMatteis's Creature Commandos from like 1980, number one, um, before December show that I'm very excited about. Uh, we've also got Justice Society of America, number 12, Multiverses Collision Detected, number two. That first issue surprised the hell out of me with how good it was. It actually made my top nine a couple weeks back. It is so fun how they're reinventing stuff to make multiverses fit comic canon. My Adventures of Superman, number five. That is based on the canon of the animated show, the Jack Quaid show that he voices. Uh, nice House by the Sea, number three. A very dark book. I'm very excited for more uh, spooky James Tynan stuff, especially this time of year. Plastic Man No More, number two. Very intrigued by that book. I liked the first issue. Poison Ivy 26. That book's been great for like three years. Definitely recommend it. Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? Number 130, as well as Shazam, number 16. From Image Comics, we've got The Deviants, number eight. I think that's near the end of the run, and it's been an amazing run so far. We've got Free Agents 4, Hyde Street, number one. I Hate Fairyland, 16, as well as Redcoat, number six and The Walking Dead Deluxe number 98. Uh, that is going to do it from those publishers. I think that is going to be, it's a smaller week because the week of, um, the last week of the month is usually the biggest for me, so the first week is a little smaller. And then from Dark Horse, the last publisher is going to be Nemesis Rogue Gallery number three. There's some cool stuff from Boom. You know, I love Boom. There's some cool stuff from IDW and Dynamite, but none of my must-pulls. So that is going to do it for this week in comics. If you like this new longer format, let me know. This show might start being live soon. Um, there's going to be some big shifts that are either going to be temporary or permanent, but we're going to be trying out some stuff very soon, and This Week in Comics might be an hour long live. Uh, and I'm going to try to do it Tuesday so I can get you guys the poll. But uh, that's all to be determined. Um, and some new changes coming that, again, might be forever on the channel, might just be for a few weeks, might be a few months, but some new stuff is cooking. So... Please, let's grow this video because I need to show that you guys want more of this week in comics. So that's why I put the uh, Joker non-spoiler on here because I'm hoping it drives more casual fans to find comic stores through these comics. And you guys, if you're watching to the end of this video, are the support system. So please, your homework for this video is let me know if you liked the first Joker and accepted it as an Elseworld or were bothered that it wasn't really the Joker from Batman. Or let me know what you thought of Joker 2. If you've seen it, let me know. Let's have a conversation. Let's stick to joker stuff we can talk about whatever but the homework is joker centric and letting me know what comics from last week you dug let's have talks let's grow this this page and this corner of it this week in comics i want to grow so let's keep uh, that like going let's keep that subscription bell going let's keep the comments going thank you very much i'll see you tomorrow for the joker spoiler filled review and then next week i got a saturday night live or saturday night the movie review i'm really excited to share so stay tuned for all that see you soon bye